Our Hebrew Bible reading today is short. It comes from the larger passage in Exodus containing the Ten Commandments. Our theme for this Lenten season has been time, something that God seems to take pretty seriously. The Sabbath, the day of rest, is named near the top of the list. The practice of consciously setting time apart to rest, to be in community, and to be with God was, was and still is radical. We do well to be reminded of this commandment in the midst of our bustling lives. Now from Exodus 20, verses 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Well, our choir always sounds good, and the music is always very well selected, but today that felt a little special, so thank you. Our gospel reading this morning comes from the second chapter of John's gospel. We've been reading a lot from Mark this season, but we're going to get a little bit of John this is immediately, this is very early on in Jesus' ministry. This is after his first, uh, what could be called his first miracle, where he transforms water into wine at the wedding at Cana. Uh, and then this is the incident immediately afterward in John's telling. This is Jesus clearing the temple, uh, a story that will probably be familiar to many of you. Hear these words from John's gospel. This is chapter 2, verses, starting at verse 13. The Passover festival was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip out of cords, he drove all of them from the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. They then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then they said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Holy, eternal one, you who are our beginning and our end, send your still speaking spirit into our midst this day. Open our hearts and our minds to your word. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I'm going to be honest. I don't know if I would have been friends with Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I love Jesus. I'm all for the way that he shows us. Jesus was a poor, marginalized person who always took the side of those who were oppressed there's a lot I like about him. Jesus was a person so radically committed to the idea of peace that he literally allowed himself to be killed for it. Jesus was and is amazing. 
But I generally like to be around people who are easygoing, laid back, chill. And despite the cloying, sentimental light that generations of artists and interpreters have painted Jesus in, he was not an easygoing guy. I can imagine he probably didn't have a ton of friends. Sometimes he might not have been fun to be around. This passage that we've just read comes from the second chapter of John's Gospel. Jesus has called a few disciples, turned some water into wine, and then he just launches straight into this. Jesus takes everything really seriously, and he takes the sanctity of the temple very seriously. I get frustrated sometimes when I hear people try to talk about Jesus and interpret him as if he simply didn't care about traditions or rules. People talk about Jesus sometimes like he was a quirky Silicon Valley entrepreneur who didn't think any of the rules should apply to him. And that's just not who he was. Jesus was someone who was, yes, constantly in tension with his traditions and community, but it was not because he thought there needed to be fewer or more lax rules. He was continually upset because he saw the ways that his own community was failing to keep the important rules. If anything, Jesus wanted his community to live out the commandments more fully, to actually take the law and the prophets more seriously. Jesus was a bit of a zealot. We forget that sometimes. He wasn't content with people checking off the boxes. He insisted that people love their neighbor as much as themselves, not just in a sort of perfunctory, performative way. Jesus clears the temple with a whip that he makes of some leather cords. He simply cannot abide the way that inequality and dishonesty has been allowed to creep into this sacred space. Jesus sees the extortion, the shrewd dealings of the marketplace, which had taken root so deeply in people's hearts that they'd begun to intertwine it with their spiritual lives, risked choking out some of the better, sweeter fruits of the Spirit. The temple here creates a concrete example of the spiritual reality. Jesus wasn't the kind of reformer who wanted to get rid of every single rule. As I said, Jesus took the questions of religious and ethical life seriously. He just, he just shifted the focus. Jesus seems to care a lot about the sanctity of the temple. He seems to insist, though, that what defiles this temple, what risks defiling the temple, it's not the presence of Gentiles or sinners, but the presence of people willing to exploit one another. Holy space for Jesus is still holy space, but I think he pushes a little bit, expands the notion of what true, genuine holiness entails. If you are not loving one another, taking care of one another, then you have failed, Jesus seems to say. You have failed to keep even the first commandment. If you do not love your neighbor, who bears the sacred image of God, then how can you claim to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, and your strength? This episode in the temple, which stands out for the fact that Jesus seems to so clearly express fierce anger and disgust, is actually, I think, really in line with a lot of his overall critiques. Again, sometimes we soften it, but Jesus took this stuff really seriously. Notably, we often see Jesus being challenged about the Sabbath, right? Healing on the Sabbath, allowing his disciples to pick and eat grain on the Sabbath. You could read that, and a lot of people do, to think that Jesus didn't take 
the Sabbath or any of the rules seriously, but his response to these critiques is pretty consistent throughout all of the Gospels. It is always good and right to do what is good and right on the Sabbath. Jesus clears the temple because it is sacred space being defiled by greed. And I wonder what Jesus would say if he looked at our calendars. He'd probably be confused by the fact that we gather on Sunday rather than Saturday, but he would probably be okay with that, I think. I think, though, Jesus was upset because he saw that the temple, this holy place, had not clearly transformed people. It was a place that was supposed to change people. It was a place that was supposed to change the world. It was clear that despite the fact that there were there, present in that sacred space, it hadn't really changed the people. And I think that's the same way Jesus speaks and feels and teaches about the Sabbath. The Sabbath, the time for resting, for slowing down, for being in God's presence is supposed to change us. Like the temple, it is set apart, marked as sacred so that it can do just that. The temple was supposed to change spatial reality. If God had an actual place, a physical dwelling place on earth among the people, then every place was in some kind of relationship to it. Every place on the earth, whether it was within the bounds of the temple or outside, had some kind of a spatial, tangible, meaningful relationship to God. And the Sabbath is supposed to do that with our temporal reality. The experience of sacred time, time set apart, a day devoted to God, to fellowship, to rest, to living the love of God is supposed to change the other six days. When we pay attention to how we spend our time and our rest, it should also permeate our times of work, travel, play, all of it. If it doesn't do that, then perhaps it needs some deconstruction, some reconstruction and revamping. Our lives have become incredibly busy, filled to the brim with expectations, responsibilities, duties. None of these things are wrong in themselves. That's part of living in flesh. We work to get our bread, right? That is in scripture. These things are not bad in themselves, but if we're not mindful of them, they begin to creep and creep and creep until we find that the boundaries of time, like the boundaries of the temple, the boundaries around this sacred space and time start to become porous. As the greed of the market seeped into the temple, so the frenzy and the greed of the market can seep into our calendars. But we cannot let our cleansing of our calendars become another thing we have to do. We're, as much as we're bombarded with the need to work and do and accomplish more, we are also bombarded with the idea that we need to work and do more, to carve out more time to not do any work. It's a little bit counterintuitive. So I want to invite you to practice unbusyness. We can't turn making space, making time. We can't turn that into another agenda item. It has to become a practice, an ongoing living way that we spend our time, that we engage with one another and with the world. So as we prepare to gather at this communion table,
this practice that is so central to our life, something so simple but radically powerful in its ability to reorient us to space, to time, to all creation. I want to invite us to dwell a little bit in sacred time, in a spirit of unhurriedness. I want us to take our time with communion today. There's no rush. This table isn't going anywhere. We should come to this table with great hope, expectation. We should be excited to come to this communion table. I know I'm always excited to come to this table. But we should approach it slowly, leisurely, with a proper sense of awe and joy. The temple was supposed to change the world. The Sabbath, sacred time, time spent in fellowship with God, is supposed to be a temple in time. It is supposed to change the world and our orientation to it. It's supposed to change our minutes, our hours, our days, our years. I pray that today we will sink into that practice, even if just for a few minutes. Let it settle over us. Let us settle in to this moment apart from time, set aside from the busyness of our lives, and just be present to God. So may it be today and in all of our days. Amen.